Welcome back to the next lesson. This is the part three on the Age of Enlightenment. I know this one's been going a little bit long, but there is so much to get into here. Um, and this won't be the last one. We probably have one or two more after this on just the Age of Enlightenment before we even get into the French Revolution and things like that. So that being said, we'll move forward. Now, if you're recognizing this slide from last time, uh, well, this is from last time, but it's, I need to go over this one more time. I shouldn't say, I'm not going to go all over it one more time, but I need to have this in your minds as we go into the next. So this whole part of the lesson is going to be talking about the people that gave us ideas that I've been talking about in the first two lessons that, that you've watched up to this point. Um, uh, but again, just quickly, what is the social contract? The social contract is the idea that uh, wherever this the social contract is, you know, if it's closer to more freedom or if it's closer to more totalitarianism, um, it's the idea that if it's going this way, it's taking away our personal choice. If it's going this way, it's get, it, we have more personal choice. And then, so how much in personal choice are we willing to give up in order to have a peaceful society? That's the whole idea behind the social contract. And it's one of the most argued about things to this day. We're always arguing about this one, you know. And, and the idea of where should that slider be in order to to engender the most happiness possible for individuals in society. Anyways, so I showed you this as well. I'm not going to cover this too much again, but you know, the social contract that is a free society is on the top. Social contract that represents what a totalitarian society is on the bottom. Um, anyways, moving on from there. Now, where do we get all this stuff from? Not just the social contract, although that's what this guy's going to be dealing with a lot, but uh, religious tolerance, all those enlightened ideas we talked about, all these ideas that have essentially established what is normal today, the way you and I think it was right and wrong, why, we can, why I can say things like, I don't want to do that, you can't make me do that. You know, where do these, these ideas come from? Um, or if I say, that's not right, that can't happen. Um, uh, you know, where do these ideas come from? First guy we're going to talk about, one of the earliest Enlightenment thinkers, is a guy named Thomas Hobbes. He's from England, and he actually lived during the English Civil War. That's, that's actually important to, context to have. I'll explain that in a second. But he's actually the guy that comes up with the word, uh, or, or with the term social contract. But the funny thing is, is that when he came up with it, he comes up in a way that we today, as Americans, completely disagree with. Um, he believes that all people were born evil and so therefore had to be forced to be good. So he says, you know what? Yeah, maybe a king isn't the best guy ever, but if we just did what he said, more people, we wouldn't have all this death and destruction. We wouldn't have these civil wars because you know, he lived through the English Civil War and he saw that, hey, you know what? Maybe the English king wasn't the greatest guy ever, but if we just would have just not rebelled, we wouldn't have had all this death and destruction and unhappiness. So it's better to be told what to do in life uh, than to have essentially personal freedoms. Notice that nice little um, picture I have down at the bottom. Thomas Hobbes philosopher, freedom is good, security is better. So he would argue, like Thomas Hobbes argued for this one more. Not that extreme, by the way. He'd probably have the social contract more about like right there, if that helps you out a little bit. But he's like, yeah. You can't give too many people too many choices because too many bad things happen. That was his opinion, which we're thankful he came up with this whole idea of the social contract, but we very much, as Americans, disagree with Hobbes today on that idea. Now, he actually outlines all of this in a book he calls The Leviathan. I'm not going to go into this. Um, you know, this is a college class. You probably, this would be like required reading type thing, possibly. Um, I personally have never read it myself. Um, but yeah, this is where he outlines most of his ideas from. Now, this guy is a little bit different. John Locke. He's not the guy that came up with a social contract, but just to put it out front there, this is the guy Americans love. That um, the American way of life is based off the ideas a lot of John Locke. I'm going to be going over more philosophers, a couple more after this. Well, not a ton, but a few more. But if you want to know who we agree with most, or who, where we get most our ideas from, our idea of the way society should be like, this is one of the main guys. Not the only one, but he is one of the main ones, and you'll see why here in a second. 
Now, if you notice there, it says, though John Locke, uh, John Locke has a very different view than Thomas Hobbes. Basically, he argues that no, people are inherently good. We will do the right thing if given the choice to do so. Um, now, yeah, it doesn't mean everybody will, but you can pretty much say that most people will. That, hey, you know, if any one of us in a situation are like, oh, wow, that person needs help, we would most likely go off and help her. Or we'd say things, yeah, you're right, that's really not fair, maybe I'll change my ways. Like, you know, he says that most people are, are that way, that we're born more inherently good. Um, by the way, that's one of the biggest arguments in history and still an argument going on today. Are people born good or are people born bad? Hobbes says bad. John Locke says good. Uh, if you guys took my, I'm sorry about this segue, but if you took my ancient world history class, remember we actually had that uh, that discussion. We were talking about Chinese philosophies where um, da, I'm sorry, uh, Confucianism argued that people are born good and legalism, uh, the Chinese philosophy of legalism, argued that people are bad. These two guys, Hobbes, who we just had earlier, and Locke now, same thing. Uh, you, know, you base everything off of... That changes your whole world perspe perception. Now. If you view people as good or bad. Um, go. I like having a good discussion on this one in class. I realize I'm about to go off in the weeds in it, so I'm just going to stop. But just know that's a big difference to in how you view the world. Do you view people as good or bad? If this helps you out in any way, if you're wondering, well, where am I? Um might not be the best test, but it's the best one I can give you at the moment. Um, when you first meet someone, the very first time you ever meet someone, are you more willing to trust them or are you more distrustful of them? And that gives you an idea of where you might be at on the idea of like, do you, people, do you think people are inherently good or inherently bad? Of course, there's more of the idea of like your experiences and how many people have betrayed you in life and time and stuff like that or people that have helped you out and throughout your life. That definitely goes into your decisions there. Uh, but also know, I just said I wasn't going to go into it, now I'm going into it. But just know that uh, you can change that. People actually change all the time. You know, people can get, you know, sometimes even day to day. I think all people are bad today. And then I wake up tomorrow, all people are good today. You know, you can be like that. Uh, but John Locke is essentially saying here, no, it's good just all the time to view people as born inherently good. Yes, they can become bad through their actions, but they're born inherently good people. And with that part, he says, you know, even though we do need, you know, if we could actually live without a government, uh, potentially, if everybody could just live by the golden rule and be good, but we know it's not possible. Well, all weaknesses, things happen, people have difference of opinions. So there's certain things that just need to be guaranteed. And so therefore, our government is needed to protect our lives, our liberty, our freedom of choice, and our property. And so you have some nice John Locke quotes off here to the left. Uh, that are, are those are actual John Locke quotes. So I had fun with this one. When I found that one, I just had to put it in. I thought it was funny. If you're a Trekkie, so um, it's also from Locke that we get this idea. I brought this term up earlier with the social contract, popular sovereignty, but the governments get the right of rule from the governed. Uh, yes, you have this idea from the ancient Greeks and Romans, uh, but John Locke takes it a step further. Uh, and and also reintroduces it to uh, modern societies today. And uh, one of the things he said that goes into the American Revolution, by the way, is he argued that, you know what, if a government is not protecting your life, liberty, and property, if it, uh, which he says are your natural rights, there's Locke's version of natural rights, if the government isn't doing that, then the people have the right to rise up against the government. Now, I just need to stop right there for a second. Uh, that is a justification for the War of Independence, uh, America versus Great Britain, uh, the colonies versus Great Britain. Has that be, uh, argument been used since then in not so nice ways? Yeah. Uh, one example I'll give you there is the Unabomber, Timmy the McVeigh, uh, because he felt like the government was ruining his natural rights. He decided, I'm going to go bomb a government building in Oklahoma City. Uh, killed a lot of people, especially most of which were actually kids there at a daycare. Um, so at what point is it okay to do something like that, to take away other people's lives because you're mad about the fact that you think the government has taken away your rights? If, if you get where I'm going here, this there's a lot of arguments going back and forth here. I'm not trying to establish what is right versus wrong because in, in the idea of the American Revolution, we'd say, yeah, you know, Great Britain was taking away your rights. 
in the case of Tammy McVeigh, no. You're just a crazy guy that just used that argument to your own ends. You're more selfish about it. So, anyways, just food for thought there on that one a bit. Just know John Locke, like, he is the philosopher that Americans look to most. Like, that guy had it right. Now, another guy that we look to uh, today is a guy named Baron, um, Baron de Montesquieu, or just Montesquieu. And this will be simple. He comes up with just, uh, he actually, well, look at the bottom part first, where it says, Montesquieu is a prime example of someone who looks to the past to gain answers for the present and future. And then look at the picture of Montesquieu up on the left. It looks like a Roman senator. He loved the past. He loved ancient Rome. He loved ancient Greece. And he thought they had some good ideas. And he spent his entire life essentially saying, what ideas from the past can we take and, and utilize them or maybe even transform them a bit today to make them better? And one of the things that came up with is like, you know what? In the Roman, uh, in the Roman Republic, they did something that didn't work out so well for them. It was actually something called the Triumvirate. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. If you took my ancient history class, hopefully you remember what that is. He's like, you know what? This idea of separation is power is good. But the Romans didn't quite have it right. Uh, you know, they put the power in the person. But if we put the power in the institution and people cycle out of that, meaning that you know senators are elected and then leave, presidents come in and leave, um, judges come in and leave, but the power is always there in the institution, that might work. And so he argued for this idea of separation of powers, at least into three, so you can have a check and balance in government that would have ultimately protect the liberty or freedom of choice of the people. And the United States really led the way on this one. Now, Britain did too. Do you need, do you need to put that in? You can argue that Britain did first. <laughs> Americans just like to say, we did it better <laughs> with the idea of like legislative, executive, and judicial branches uh, uh, patterned out in the Constitution of the United States. So essentially that whole idea what our constitution is based off of, and the separation of powers between the three branches of government, we get from Montesquieu. Anyways, don't need to go into it too much more than that, uh, and, and, but that is a major thing to, to, to look for you to know. Um, anyways, moving on. Now, this guy is going to... <laughs> Once I say this, I wonder if people are going to be like, oh, I don't want to listen to this anymore. This guy's going to take a little bit of explaining. Uh, a guy named Voltaire, real name is Francois-Marie Arouet. Um, anyways, he was very, this guy was way into guys like John Locke. He comes after John Locke. John Locke lived before him um, and, and uh, loved Isaac Newton as well, uh, both English philosophers, but he himself is a French philosopher. Um I'll just put all this up right now. Oh, I think I can do this one at a time. Sorry. For those of you who like to scrub through the videos, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say I'm sorry. should be listening. But uh, uh, this is the guy where we get this. You know, John Locke talked about free speech and religious tolerance. But Voltaire was probably the most outspoken on it. He wrote about it the most. So we look to him a lot in this idea of like, okay, a free society should have free speech. A free society should have religious tolerance. Yeah, John Locke did talk about this, though, but again, Voltaire was just more of the vocal one on it. Uh, that quote right there, we hear this all the time in our society. If you have not heard this, this, well, you need to hear this quote. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it, meaning you are entitled to your own opinion, no matter what that opinion is. No matter how much I disagree with it, you should be allowed to say it. So... I uh, do need to so, say, though, that, that that quote actually, he says it different ways. That's the one we usually quote today. Um, I forgot who actually quoted that way, but it, it was a woman. And she was quoting, Vol she was taking what Voltaire's, I'm explaining too much. Anyways, that's not exactly the way Voltaire said it, but we get that idea from Voltaire. So, now, this is also the guy who was very much reason over superstition. Just really quickly though, a lot of uh, atheists today look at Voltaire as like greatest ever, you know, uh, he's awesome and rightfully so. Like, you know, he does come up with a lot of things that, that uh, justify atheist, atheist way of thinking. Uh, but do you need to know that Voltaire did believe in God? He just really did not like organized religion. He 
hated the Catholic Church more than anything else. He wasn't too friendly with many other churches either, though. Um, but he did recognize that, you know, people have their beliefs and they should be allowed to have those beliefs. If they want to be Catholic, they should be allowed to be Catholic. If they want to be Protestant, they should be allowed to be Protestant. And he also noticed that, especially in places like England, where religious tolerance was coming around a little bit better, things went well. That You know, you didn't have people at each other's throats. You didn't have so much totalitarian control of like a, the Catholic-dominated France, the country he lived in. He looks at England and says, you know what, you're allowed to be Catholic or Protestant up there. It's okay, and they're getting along. You know, this religious tolerance thing is really good. So, uh, but anyways, that's that's his basis there Voltaire's basis he does believe in a god but he he did not like organized religion um, and you like he viewed the catholic church especially as just this religious tyranny that was evil so i'm not going to explain what a deist oh, maybe i should you can tell i'm just kind of doing these lessons off the top of my head here but uh um, by the way, a deist is someone who views the idea that God has just created the world and then just stepped back. And he said, you guys do your thing, and I'll just watch from above. So, let's see. Yeah, and Voltaire was very much of this mindset of who, what, how God did things. He didn't necessarily really interact much with the people on earth. Just kind of saw how things went. Now, I came up with this. I used this term. I, use, I, I gave you the explanation of the invention of the word liberal in the first lesson this is the guy that really pushed the idea of liberalism and the idea of what it means to be open you're open to new ideas again just pause for a second this is not talking about what liberals are today uh, in fact you could even say a lot of people who say they're liberals today politically are not really liberal in the sense of the traditional idea of liberal, like that they're open to change. In some cases they are, some cases they aren't. You know, people that aren't don't consider themselves liberal politically today can still be liberal in the traditional sense of like, hey, I'm open to try something new. Hopefully I explained that well to you guys. But Voltaire really, 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 really pushed this, saying, hey, if we're going to try these things out, we need to have a majority of people who are open to trying this out. It doesn't mean you have to accept it, but at least just try it out. Well, you know, this is like a, an experiment, a science experiment. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, we stop it. So, uh, but he really, really, really pushed this idea of everybody needs to be open to this. You know, this can work better if people are open to it. Um, again, he's not the only... Notice how I keep saying this over and over with Voltaire. He's not the only person, nor is he the first person to do all this stuff. He is just the most vocal. And he really does do a fairly good job of, of arguing the point that, hey, in an argument, you need to look at both sides. You just can't be blind on your way of thinking. You need to see, try to understand what the other person is saying. And then also look at all the possible consequences of a decision that you might be arguing about. So that hopefully you can come to the best decision possible as you've debated this and argued about it with someone else. And in fact, arguments can be very positive things if both sides look at it this way. If not, then they just turns into the idea that one side just wants to punch the other side out or you know, get a big fight. Now, because of all this, because he's the most vocal on all these things that are very enlightened ideas, and definitely have this in your notes, Voltaire is known as the Father Enlightenment. No, he is not the first philosopher. You, you could argue that's in guys like Thomas More and Thomas Hobbes, uh, and even a couple guys before them. Uh, but the guy that really brought all these ideas and was the most vocal about all of them is Voltaire, so hence he is called the Father of the Enlightenment. And yes, he is very influential in the founding of the United States, especially when the ideas like free speech and religious tolerance. Uh, and uh, basically our founding fathers quote him a lot now next guy adam smith uh i'll try to explain him a little quicker this is a guy you guys should already know about but if you don't this is the father of modern economics aka capitalism the free market system so uh, in fact the term free market is something that we get from him now, other terms we get from him today, terms that you should understand and do know, and that's why I'm going to go over them really quick, laissez-faire, free market, and invisible hand. So, 
And the book that he writes where all these ideas are entailed into is what's called The Wealth of the Nations. Now, basically, the argument that Adam Smith has is, hey, you know what? Let people do what they want to do. You know, if one person wants to be a construction worker and one person wants to be a clockmaker, let them do it. And if there's a thousand people who want to be clockmakers and two people who want to be construction workers, then most likely a bunch of those clockmakers will transition over becoming construction workers. Maybe it's not what they want to do, but they realize that's where the money is. If there's if there's a demand for construction workers, then those people will go over there. And then I just explained there actually what the invisible hand is. That hey, uh, this is one of those. They call it the invisible hand. It's a hard concept to explain. But when I just use that example of clock workers or construction workers, it's almost like an invisible hand pushed a bunch of those clock workers to become construction workers because they realized they'd have a better life if they did so. Yeah, it might not be their dream and what they want to do in life, but they'll be able to provide for their families better. And heck, they'll have a really good life doing something that maybe isn't the greatest job that they want in the first place, but maybe they will learn to love it over time. That's what we call the invisible hand. You know, just decisions that go in, uh, and people's personal decisions that make the world work because they just realize where they can fit into or how they can create something within that. And in order for uh, basically this free market, this idea that you can do what you want to do, but you'll probably do what best benefits you, that's free market and invisible hand put it together there, that you have to have what's called laissez-faire, which means, by the way, uh, which means government stay away. Government, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me that I can only sell my clocks for $100 a piece and I can't sell lower or higher than that one. Don't tell me that I can only be a clock worker and only a clock worker. I should be able to be something else if I want to. Um, you know, just stay out. The only thing government should do when it comes to economics is make sure that people are playing fair. Hey, that guy burned down my clock shop. Can you please, you know, jack him and take all his money away and give it to me because he ruined my business. You know, that's the only uh, reason for government and economics. Other than that, government should not interfere with what I want to do with my life, uh, prices I want to set, um, things like that. You know, let the, let the invisible hand do that, essentially. And by the way, that has been the economic theory of the United States. Now, we have not been purely free market oriented. Our government does get involved here and there, um, and more so over the last 60 years. You could say since uh, uh, Lyndon, President Lyndon B. Johnson than anything else. Um, anyways, don't want to go down that road too much there, but there's Adam Smith for you. And hugely revolutionary in this idea of like, hey, let people do what they want. Let them be free and what they want to do for their jobs and how they want to live their lives, especially when it comes to how you uh, buy, sell, and trade. You know, government, stay out. Now, last guy we're going to talk about, I know this lesson is going a little bit long, almost done, but I would like to just finish all the philosophers in, the, in this one. I think we have this guy and, and one more person after this. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the only reason I am including this guy in here is because we, as Americans, we, we don't agree with him, mostly. Yeah, he does have some good ideas here or there, but in the end... It really comes down to kind of, how do we view this? France likes to follow the philosophies of Rousseau. The United States likes to follow the philosophies of John Locke. And the philosophies of those two don't necessarily meld together. They differ in their opinions on what the um, natural rights of man are and what, the, what equality is. Um, I'm not going to go way into that. So I'm just going to explain some major things here uh, that come from Rousseau that, yeah, we don't necessarily get into too much. So he's a French philosopher, by the way. Oh, he's actually Swiss. I, th I believe he was born in Geneva, Switzerland. Anyways, but he lives in France for most of his life, and he lives in England as well for a little bit of his life. But he's known for these three uh, philosophical tenets. Number one, civilization is not a good thing, but a bad thing. Uh, essentially, naturally, good humans are corrupted by growing up in society. Essentially you're saying, hey, you know, when you're born, you're born a good little baby. It's this great life. And all of a sudden, society puts all these laws and restrictions on you. And therefore, you're not a free person. Um, uh, that's why I put that quote, uh, that Rousseau quote in there. Man is born free everywhere, but everywhere he's in chains. Man was born free and everywhere he is in chains. 
just the idea that you know you just can't get away from the, the oppressiveness of society and cultural traditions and things like that by the way that is a really radical thing even still to say today because it's just of course you're gonna have like societies and cultures that, you, know, you know just the fact of having a friend means that you're gonna come up with some some strictures of how you guide your lives together and everything. that's why Americans have a hard time those guys like well I can see why you're saying that but you're way off on the, you're way off in the weeds on that one or so sorry but you're way off in the weeds you know there's some things like hey the golden rule is a nice thing to live by that's not a chain uh, that's a good moral to live by anyways number two feeling should replace reason to guide in our judgments this is one of those weird ones like he comes from the enlightenment the age of reason and now he's saying that feelings should replace reason no absolutely not um you know you could argue that in some cases here and there especially maybe a religious sense you could put that in there like you know what i felt like you know people that do believe in god like, i felt like god was pushing me this way although it just didn't seem illogical um like that's the only time i could see and maybe justify that but in just any given situation you know reason things out you know look at voltaire now, this is very anti-Voltaire there to say that, that feelings should replace reason yeah, yeah, uh, in judgments. You know, it's like, no, what's, what are the logical conclusions? What are the consequences? You know, make your decision after you've looked at everything. Yeah, maybe you still go with what you feel, but at least reason it out first. Um, anyways, uh, that's, we look at that and it's like, no, we don't want our judges like judging right and wrong in our society and like i feel like you should go to prison who cares what the facts say you know we, we don't want that so number three society should be subordinate to the general will you could say we agree and disagree with this one a little bit you know he says down there argues that individual will is different from the will of society's collective being it's like well if you say general will in the idea of voting, I guess so. You know, we know that no one's ever gonna, we're never gonna have a hundred percent vote for anyone. So we know that, you know, in that case, uh, majority should rule. Uh, you know, if if sixty six percent of society wants us, and I guess we should go that way, even though it may, you know. But I guess when you look at general will that way, but that's not necessarily what he's arguing. He's saying that no, whatever's good for the whole of society trumps anything that an individual can do meaning that individual liberties your right to choose social contract um isn't as important as what's important for everyone at the time and uh, i actually just did a lesson in my u.s wars class talking about this a bit but uh, uh rousseau that that idea from rousseau is quoted a lot by uh people who believe in things like communism and socialism you know it's like, you know what your individual property your individual freedom of choice doesn't matter because you're ruining it for everybody else so you just need to get in line and you need to be forced to get in line um and just that does not fly america that is very anti-american america is based off the idea of, of individual liberties and freedom so uh anyways I'm going to leave it at that. I could go into more on Rousseau. Again, there are some things that he says that we'd be like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll go with that one. For the most part, though, he's the philosopher that, from an American point of view, no, you just, we're not going to use your stuff. So, now last part where it says he believes that the best outcome of man is to return to the idea of state of nature. If you remember that lesson from the Renaissance on utopianism, Rousseau is one of those guys that thinks that utopian society is the idea of like going back to nature. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Like, that's actually what he referenced all the time. It's like, life was perfect when it was just Adam and Eve in the Garden. There wasn't done all these civilization restrictions. So, um, a lot of philosophers disagreed with him on that one, by the way. I'm not going to get into it right now because this lesson's already gone a bit too long. So, uh, in fact, I'm because this has gone too long, I'm going to end it right now. And we are going to have uh, one, more, one more lesson on this one. I was trying to keep it to just three parts, but uh, anyways. All right, or... I think I was doing it. I'll stop right now. Bye-bye.